In high school, I learned that Newton figured out that the reason why the planets are going around the sun is because they're all being pulled towards the sun with a force called gravity. I learned about this law, I learned how to apply it and solve numericals, but what I didn't really learn, or even question for that matter, is how did Newton figure out that the force was towards the sun? I mean, we soon figured out, as we will see, that the planets are not really going around in perfect circles, but they're going around in elliptical orbits, making things even more complicated. Yet, Newton was convinced, elliptical orbits or not, planets are always exactly being pulled towards the sun. And this is by no means obvious. In fact, back then, people thought that the planets were being pushed from behind. That's what kept them going in the orbit because that's the kind of intuition we get from our experiences in our daily life. And so the burning question we wanna try and answer in this video is how exactly did Newton prove the world that uh -uh, they're not being pushed from behind, planets are exactly being pulled towards the center of the sun. And this is where I think science gets really interesting. It's not just about learning the laws and its applications, but it's also about learning how did people discover it hundreds of years ago. And what blows my mind away when it comes to this specific story is that all the piece of math you would need for this is the area of triangles. So today, just by using high school geometry and pen and paper, you and I are going to rediscover what Newton did, prove the world that the sun indeed pulls all the planets towards itself. If you're ready for this, let's begin. So where do we begin? Well, we begin at where most scientific discoveries begin by standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before you. In the early 1600s, Galileo Galilei had already pretty much uncovered the law of inertia. From his experiments, Galileo concluded that moving things tend to just keep moving all by itself. You don't need to keep pushing on it. This is called the law of inertia. The reason we don't see it in our day-to-day -day life is because there is always some or the other force that is opposing the motion, like the force of friction or air resistance or something else. These forces are the ones that slow our thing or moving things down and make them stop. And to oppose these forces in our daily lives, we have to keep pushing on things to make them move. But you get rid of all these forces, then you don't need any force to keep moving things in motion. Moving things keep moving with the same velocity in a straight line all by itself if there are no forces acting on it. This is the law of inertia. Around the same time, Johannes Kepler was recording the positions of the planets carefully. He was observing the heavens. And what he concluded is that the planets obeyed a very specific rule. As the planet goes around the sun, let's say the earth itself, Imagine a line connecting the sun and the earth. Now, wait for some time, say a couple of months, and find the area swept by this line. What he found is that this area swept in that same time, two months, will always be the same, regardless of where the planet is in its orbit. In other words, planets sweep equal areas in equal time intervals. Kepler or anyone back then had no idea why the heavens were conspiring to obey this very, very oddly specific rule. And it was Newton who connected Galileo's earthly experiments with Kepler's observations of the heavens and said, aha, Kepler's law can only mean one thing. All the planets must be pulled exactly towards the sun. He probably didn't say that. He instead wrote a book, Principia, and wrote down his arguments. But again, the question is, how did he do that? I mean, let's take a moment over here. How on earth would Kepler's law of equal areas directly translate to the planets being pulled towards the center of the sun? It's by no means obvious even today to me, and yet we'll see all we will need to make this connection is the area of triangles. Here's the earth going around the sun. If I pause right now, at this moment, our earth is moving in this direction. Its velocity is tangential to the path. Now let's think a little bit about what if there was no force acting on the Earth here on? Then from the law of inertia, we know that it would keep moving in that straight line forever with that same velocity. So what I do now is I ask myself, okay, what if I wait for some time? Let's say I wait for a short time, say one day. 
one day is a pretty short time considering the entire orbit. So if I wait for just say one day, then my Earth, if there was no force acting on it, would have come somewhere over here. This is the position of the planet if there was no force acting on it. And now I ask myself, but hey, there is a force acting, so what is the real position of the planet? It's gonna be somewhere on that orbit, on that path. So the actual position of the planet after a day is somewhere over here. So this is the position without the force. This is the position with the force. So I say, aha, the planet got deflected in this direction, so that must be the direction of the force. Now, remember, we have only considered a small time, one day. In that time, the planets don't move much. So I have just exaggerated the position of the, figure, of the planets over here. So a real picture would be somewhat like this. The planets would be actually very close. The Earth would have hardly moved. And the reason I'm saying this is because that means it's more appropriate to think that that force is actually acting at this position itself. The Earth has hardly moved. And there you go. The force is somewhat towards the sun. I can repeat this again. I can now say, ah, now the direction of the earth is this way. Again, tangent to the path. So if there was no force acting on our planet and if I waited for one day, it would have been somewhere over here on its new inertial path now. But again, I know that there is a force acting and I know that the planet is moving along that path. And so the actual position of the planet in one day is going to be somewhere here again. Without the force, this is the position. With the force, this is the position. So I say, aha, the planet got deviated in that direction. And so that must be the direction of the force. And again, I've exaggerated the figure. So that force is pretty much acting at this point. And again, you can see, hey, the force is directed towards the sun. Just from the law of inertia, we can pretty much guess the force is directed towards the sun. But notice my use of the words maybe and somewhat. Sure, I know that now the force is somewhere inwards, but how do I know for sure if it's actually exactly directed towards the sun? I mean, maybe the force is slightly tilted upwards or maybe the force is slightly tilted downwards. How do we know whether it's exactly towards the sun? We can't know for sure just by using the law of inertia. To do that, I need to carefully observe the positions of the planet and hey, Johannes Kepler has already done that for us. And so this is where I can start using his equal areas laws. You have to imagine a line that is connecting the sun and the earth. And now according to this law, the area swept by the planet in the first day, this yellow area should be exactly equal to the area swept by the planet in the second day, this purple area, because the time interval taken is exactly the same, which is one day. And so the area swept must be exactly the same as well. So to check whether the force is really exactly directed towards the sun, all I have to do is check whether the area swept is indeed exactly equal. So let's check that. We're entering the last piece of the puzzle now. So at some random position in our Earth's orbit, let's say if I wait for one day, the Earth travels from here to here in some random direction. I'm considering a straight line because in one day, the distance traveled is so small that I can just assume it's a straight line. That's why I'm considering a small time, one day. Now my question is, what would happen if I wait for one more day if there was no force? Well, if there was no force, it would have traveled exactly that same distance because inertia. Without a force, things keep moving at that exact same velocity. So in another day, it would travel the exact same distance. But we do know that there is a force acting and our hypothesis is that that force is acting exactly towards the sun. Therefore, to find the new position of the planet, I say, hey, our planet must be shifted this way from the inertial line, giving this as the new position. And again, our question is, how do we check whether this force is exactly towards the sun? Which means we need to check whether the planet's position is exactly there, or it's gonna be slightly forward, or it's gonna be slightly backward somewhere. And for that, we use the law of equal areas. I draw a line connecting the sun and the earth, and now the area swept by the earth in the first day should be exactly equal to the area swept by the earth in the second day. Equal areas in equal time intervals. Which means all I have to check now is whether the yellow area is indeed exactly equal to the purple area. If it does, then our hypothesis is correct. So, how do we check that? Well, we know how to calculate the area of a triangle. Area of any triangle, A, equals half into base into height. 
You can choose whatever you want as the base of the triangle. So I could choose this as the base of my triangle. Then the height of the triangle would be a perpendicular drop from the opposite vertex onto the base. So this would be my height. So all I need to check is whether the base into height of my yellow triangle is it exactly the same as the base into height of my purple triangle. So it all boils down to geometry. But mind you, it's not pretty straightforward. I mean, these two triangles have very different shapes, so we need to be slightly clever about this. While comparing quantities, it's always nice if you can find something common. And over here, I see this side to be common, and so I'm gonna choose that as the base of both of my triangles. So both triangles have the same base, which means my problem now boils down to figuring out if both these triangles have the exact same height. If they do, I'm done. So the height of the yellow triangle would be perpendicular drop from the opposite vertex onto the base, that's H1. And the height of the purple triangle would be, again, a perpendicular drop from its opposite vertex onto the base, H2. So is H1 equals H2? How can I check that? This would be a good moment to pause the video and see if you can look at it from some perspective and convince ourselves whether H1 is it equal to H2 or not. Again, the beauty of geometry is sometimes looking at things from slightly different perspective, shifting things here and there. There are multiple ways to do this, but what I like to do is take that H2 and shift it parallelly all the way until it comes here. Can you see a couple of new triangles that are formed? Here, let me help you focus on that. Here we go. I can use the properties of these two triangles to actually compare heights H1 and H2. If I look at the angles, I already know these two angles are exactly the same. They're vertically opposite. I know they both have right angles, which means the, the remaining angles must also be the same. That makes these two triangles similar triangles, meaning they have their sides in the same proportion. But from the law of inertia, I know that these two sides are exactly the same. Remember, that is the distance traveled by the Earth in one day if there were no forces acting on it. That should be exactly the same. Which means all the other sides should also be exactly the same, giving H1 exactly equal to H2. So the two triangles have the same heights, they have the same base, therefore they have the same area. Again, why are they having the same area? Just to wrap our head around this, it's because the force is parallel to the base. And just to convince ourselves, think about if the force was slightly tilted upwards, then you would see the height H2 would have been larger than the third side, giving us a larger area. And if the force was slightly tilted downwards, then we'd see the height H2 would have been smaller than the third side of that triangle, giving us a smaller area. So the fact that they have the same heights can only mean one thing, that the force has to be parallel to the base. In other words, the force has to be directed towards the sun. We just connected Galileo's earthly experiments with the Kepler's heavenly observations and re-revolutionized science. But just to get the complete picture around it, here's one last question I want us to think about. What if the strength of the force changed? What if it was larger or smaller? Do you think that would affect the areas of the triangle? Can you pause and just think a little bit about that? Here's what I mean. If the force was larger than we expected, the new triangle would have a different shape, but as long as the force is still parallel to the base towards the sun, we see they have the same base, the triangles have the same height, giving us the same area. Even if the force was flipped over, even if gravity was a repulsive force, as long as it's parallel to the base, we see the two triangles have the same base, same height, giving us the same area. This basically means Kepler's second law has nothing to do with the strength of the force. It only has something to do with the direction of the force. So today we know that the force of gravity goes down as one over r square. But what we are saying is that that fact has nothing to do with the law of equal areas. So even if the force had a very different law and if it changed at different positions, it was repulsive at some places, attractive at some places, yes, your orbits would now be very weird. It will no longer be an elliptical orbit. Things would be all complicated and messy, but as long as the force is towards or away from the sun, the law of equal areas would always be obeyed. Isn't that beautiful? I really find this beautiful.
So hopefully now you may be wondering, well then how did Newton arrive at the inverse square part of his law of gravity? For that, he connected the motion of the apple, the motion of the moon, and Kepler's third law. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make a video on that as well. That's also super exciting. Finally, I hope this video motivates you to learn more about the discovery of all the other laws, not just of physics, but any branch of science for that matter. Trust me, if you do that, you'll start appreciating and loving the subject even more than you do right now. See you soon.